I'm very happy to welcome you back to the beginning of our robotics seminar for the term. I'm uh, thrilled that we're back. I'm thrilled that we're in person again uh, for this. And I'm thrilled to welcome Howe for our first talk. Uh, <clears throat> Howe is coming, he's very much working on manipulation. He's one of the, the uh, most active people in manipulation space today. He comes to manipulation from the field of perception, right? And he's on the ImageNet 2015 paper, so he's got more citations on that one paper than I will ever have <laughs> in my entire life. Uh, he's on PointNet, PartNet, ShapeNet. You know, you, uh, you, you, you know, if there's a net, well, that's not probably true, <laughs> but uh, but a lot of the nets, uh, you know, were were from his uh, his work. <clears throat> but what really impressed me, I actually I met how just in person uh, a few months ago now, and uh, and. I got to meet with him and some of his students when I visited UCSD. And um, how builds everything up from scratch? I asked him, why are you building your, simu your, um, your <laughs> Sapien simulator? And he says, well, because if you really want to understand things, you have to build everything from the ground up. I don't want to <laughs> use some other parts. I'm going to just build it all, because then I'm going to really understand it. And, and that, uh, that sort of attitude really permeated through his group and the, the way that they were thinking about problems. They weren't afraid to try to make a real time uh, ray tracing renderer, you know, they weren't afraid to try to whatever, and I, that really impressed me. And I'm very happy to hear what you have to say today, and, and, uh, and I'm very impressed with your work. So thanks for coming. Okay. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to Alberto for inviting me <laughs> and for the introduction from Russ. I feel really flattered. <laughs> I know that Russ is really the person that built everything you know, from uh, the bottom up. <laughs> so for, for my group, I really would say it's my students who are so hardworking and also um, you know, so ambitious and also and afraid of the challenges. So I'm going to introduce some of the work that um, we bought at UCSD and share some experiences. Especially, MIT is such a respected place for robotics. Anyone interested in robotics or in body AI, this is really, the, you know, to me, the, the most prestigious place. So I also hope to uh, you know, get a feedback. <coughs> um, the first time I talk with everyone, I'd like to first, I mean, not dig into the details or techniques too early, but starting from a bit of a philosophical aspect. Okay, now, now, now these people are talking about like in, embodied intelligence. Now, what does that mean? <laughs> It probably will have very different kind of interpretations to everyone. Now, from my perspective, I'd like to um, explain from those um, small story. Now, here's the honeybee. You know, honeybee um, lives by collecting honey. Okay. And there's a flower. You know, I a honeybee, but a compound eye is a honeybee. It actually has a different interpretation of the flower as we humans. This is what we see, and um, well, not exactly what honey, 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 uh, honey, honey bee see, but basically, they are super sensitive to the ultraviolet colors. Okay, you see that they will quickly identify this kind of spot, much easier than us humans. Here, a second example is about um, kicking a penalty ball. Okay. Uh, I like to play football when I was young. Um, and then I've always been amazed by like you're able to control the trajectory of the ball and getting the curves. But somehow this is not such kind of skill that you're able to learn by just the watching videos or watching like uh, the famous football players. But then you have to practice. So both of the example of the B and this kind of soccer playing uh, inspires me to move from a perception person to be more of a robotics or embodied intelligence person because perception, cognition, and action, they are intimately coupled and form a close loop. It's not only that perception provides the grounds for like performing actions, there's the feedback. You will adapt your perception you will even define the concept perceived based upon the interaction. Okay. So uh, a bit more formally, there is a so-called embodiment hypothesis, uh, which places embodied intelligence at a, a pretty uh, 
high position in the rank of uh, achieving general intelligence. But intelligence emerges in the interaction of agent with the environment and as a result of uh, sensory motor activity. Well, people might agree or disagree with it, but this, from the evolution perspective, probably is, is very likely to be true. So nowadays, you have a lot of internet data. You probably could have other routes to speed up um, you know, like the intelligence or getting the, the artificial intelligence. So such kind of philosophical view inspires I built my lab to um, <coughs> now, towards the ultimate goal of building the intelligent agents who live in human space. It's able to interact with humans and learn how we think about the world and interact with the world in a way similar to us. So I would model it as perception to build the model world and then take the action based upon the world model, which is largely how computer vision could help like the robotics community, and then consider the feedback loop. Okay. Recently, robotics, or let's say the embodied intelligence, is getting quite a hot topic. And there are a lot of groups, including companies, to push it. Um, now, uh, next, I'd like to show some of uh, the representative works. Well, probably not uh, um, just like the, the, the style, to illustrate the style of the works. And this is one, a work of my student accomplishing a rearrangement task in household environment on the AI habitat um, simulator. You see that there is the navigation of skills. There is the object manipulation skills, like um, putting out the drawer, like picking up the cup, like opening the refrigerator. Everything looks so good. And then there's a second example from the um, I Thor. Okay, that's about cracking a leg, egg, <laughs> moving a chair, um, and then do this kind of medical thing, right? That's the, um, people like to talk about for embodied intelligence. And there's a third example, which is from the I Gibson Behavior Official Demo, um, that shows you know a simulator to support five finger cutting the onion. So. This seminar has strong connection to like language and could support, for example, long horizon tasks and a lot of reasoning efforts. But I have been wondering, there is something that is actually a bit short in those kind of simulation environments or tasks. I would feel like now if you look more, they tend to those simulators for embodied intelligence tends to abstract certain procedures. Like for open drawer, you see that the gripper approaches the bowl and then suddenly they're just get snapped without a real grasping. And for a second example, um, the egg cracked itself and it gets fried. <laughs> <laughs> for a third example, if you look closely, the finger is not really holding a knife, and the onion is not, it's not really cut, right? Um, so in, in order to study you know, reasoning or long-term um, tasks, long-horizon tasks, okay, people abstract these procedures. But these short-horizon tasks that people abstract out, in fact, are hard to solve. And if you don't solve these tasks, you won't be able to build a real robot that could deploy. So my research interest is very much in solving this kind of short horizon tasks. Those short horizon tasks that are common in many of the long-term manipulation goals, I mean, to achieve many of the long-term manipulation goals, and I roughly call these short horizon tasks as manipulation. Well, the ability to solve these um, short horizon task as manipulation scales. So like here, by scale, I'm referring to some short-term tasks, uh, uh, the ability to solve, solve these short-term tasks. Okay, so here I draw another figure, which uh, you might agree or disagree, but that's just my opinion, that manipulation scales is kind of a cornerstone of embodied AI. And perhaps we can make an analogy to the status of uh, manipulation scales 
as like object recognition or detection in computer vision. It's like you could have a lot of fancy research, object rearrangement, domestic service robot, human robot interaction, but then they have to be built upon, you know, like being able to perceive basic manipulation skills. Which is like in computer vision, captioning, image captioning, um, visual question answering or scene classification. Now, if you do, if you will assume perfect object detection, suddenly <laughs> it, it's not as difficult. Okay. Um, okay, so manipulation scale, I hope that you believe is an important task. <coughs> Addressing them is an important task. However, obtaining manipulation skills itself is, is pretty hard. There are a lot of factors making it hard, and don't assume that it's actually a solved problem. Okay, so sometimes, you know, we say we could have a perfect environment, like with a lot of sensors surrounding the object to manipulate, right? But think about the embodiment like humans. If it's more like an embodiment of agents like humans, then you are, the sensing is always not perfect. Okay. Like for here, at the initial stage of um, opening this door, you could see the handle, but after a while, the handle of the door get occluded. Somehow it's like you need some ability to relate the position of the handle at the beginning and in the middle, right? There has to be some kind of a sequence modeling allows you to reason like where the handle is. And then if you're doing the precision assembly, small sensor error will be quite problematic. And there are the case of unexpected events. Like here, you're building this castle from the boxes. Now there's one of them that's not building so well. You can use handle it, right? Um, you probably need your skill to have some self-correction ability. Okay, and then there's a third example for like precision assembly. You really have very strict constraints. Even if the sensor is perfect, it's hard to control so accurately. And well, towards building more generic. I mean, agents to perform very generic ability, you hope that one robot is able to perform a lot of skills. For this point, I, I call it like generic skill. Like here, um, <laughs> this is from a Rasta yeah, uh, uh, lectures. <clears throat> um, this is soft body, right? Um, there's very complex topology that's hard. And then here, well, basically, I don't need to explain everyone. You, you see that they are hard, OK? <laughs> so it's just like the argument that skills, or manipulation skills, is definitely not a solved problem, OK? So very tricky. Um, and not only we want to have the generalizability, sorry, the generic um, skill to address a lot of different kind of uh, um, goals, but also we want a skill to be generalizable. Here, the generalizable is referring to, I mean, I mean in this context, I'm referring to like a object level generalizability. Like, it's about turning a faucet, but you see that there are so many structure variations with, of the faucet, right? It could be switched, could be on the side, could be on the top, it could be like you, swip, you, you swivel it, or you could be like you, you would need to press it or lift it. <laughs> so having a policy that will generalize the different kind of objects is tricky, okay? In general, I would feel like um, another problem that is so difficult is really like object detection. And how do we solve the problem? Um, it's through community collaborative efforts. And it's through having some kind of uh, unified evaluation protocol and also having enough data. Okay, so like, uh, some of my previous um, lessons from ImageNet and ShapeNet for helping um, the collaborative research and evaluation of like the 2D vision and the 3D vision community, I feel probably um, there are something that some lessons can be transferred to help the embodied intelligence or robotic community to, to, to grow, especially for like the manipulation scales problem. So a good data set would help to support 
the measurement of success rate and make resources and codes easily accessible by any group in the world. That's kind of um, what I hope to see in the future. Um, it's definitely not an easy job. It definitely needs the collaboration of a lot of uh, um, like universities, industry, um, units worldwide, but we do aspire to contribute something. And we hope that we would be able to contribute to building a simulation environment with rich 3D assets and the tasks. Okay. Um, which, first, we want to be realistic enough to verify the usefulness of manipulation scales. And it'll be easy to reproduce experiments from other labs. And they'll be low cost because like, you know, simulation is kind of software, right? And then would allow fast R&D cycle. Hopefully in a simulation environment that we could have a speed faster than real world. And especially you would be able to have the privileged information. Like for example, a lot of uh, interaction information, action labels or force feedback that are hard to be measured by real robots. Okay, so um, towards this goal, um, this is uh, the outline of the talk today. I will first focus on introducing the platform, or actually a task suite for manipulation skills that my lab develops, the many skill two. And then I will talk about some algorithm efforts for like doing scalable policy learning, and also about how to achieve effective 3D visual policy learning. And lastly, um, I will just be very quick in, over, you know, in, in, in overviewing some of uh, the algorithmic explorations in very simplistic setups. Basically, I mean that it's not as realistic as, as, as like a full physics um, thing. Okay, now first let me start from the many scale, actually the second version of many scale two, which is a benchmark for manipulation scales. Many scale started last year, and this year, this is like um, a second version. And the goal is to, to be a unified benchmark for generalizable molecular scales. Um, we don't say it's just a, for learning or for like vision or for like, you know, classical um, sense plan, control pipeline. We hope that it could serve everyone. It could be a fair benchmark to compare different possible ways. So we have tried to design a rich set of uh, tasks. And we have 10, 20 task families. And they're involved 2, 000, over 2,000 objects. And uh, we tried to use software engineering to make this, the environment fast, like over 2,000 FPS per GPU. And also, we provide a lot of demos. Um, if you feel like demonstration is going to make the general visibility learning uh, easier. OK. So let me give you more details about each of the features. Now, feature one is it has a lot of tasks for generic skills. We have included rigid body, articulate the body, soft the body, and fluid simulation. And then for the robots in that, there are the single arm robot, um, dual arm robot, parallel gripper, and also some specialized end effector. Like we're gr gradually growing it. For this version, there's not a five finger grippers yet. And it supports mobile manipulation, which means that the robot has a base to move or stationary manipulation, which is like, it's not moving. Okay. So we have the training and test object split and make sure that um, it's like able to evaluate a generalizability. And for here, um, for each of the tasks, we have created diverse 3D assets. They are derived from my previous work, ShapeNet. And there are also some new ones collected from the internet. And there are the softer body that are you know, um, derived from the recent work Plasticine Lab in collaboration with um, um, a group at MIT. OK, so we have 2,000, over 2,000 objects. And for each of the object, um, we make sure that they are solvable by some approach, because the, the key is like to achieve generalizable um, learning. And we have collected over 4 million demonstration frames. Okay. Um, a third feature 
which I feel is actually, my personal view is pretty important, though some, a lot of simulators ignore, is like considering multi-controller support. Okay, um, <clears throat> so in a community of like um, policy learning, a lot of times people don't care about like the controller very much. Like sometimes people even output like torque. I mean, but in fact, <laughs> From our experience, controller is very important, especially considering sim to rail domain gap. Controller pr plays a very important role. I'm also going to show you a work that controller affects the, the, the sample efficiency quite much. So for example, if you're considering the task of collision avoidance, right, in motion planning, like here, you have a lot of the obstacles and making the rover of the arm in a space at heart, joint space controller is necessary. On the other hand, the recent appear, uh, uh, experience uh, on a lot of the policy learning work is like, if you're considering like picking objects, then Cartesian space controller is a lot more convenient. So we actually uh, decide that we will provide multiple controllers and also provide the algorithm to convert demonstrations from the joint space controller, which could be position or velocity based, um, a joint space controller is like the most complete information to Cartesian space controller or other kind of controller uh, variants. Um, although it's kind of a, a, a detail, I feel like it's a very important detail, so I put it here. Okay, and the fourth is um, we develop very efficient rigid body um, visual learning environments. Okay, um, so there are, are some hard engineering challenges to be addressed to make the system very fast. And after our work, it's actually able to run at 2,000 plus FPS, probably and with a low, lower memory footprint. Probably there's uh, not easy to interpret from absolute sense, but let me show you the figure. Like in terms of memory footprint, you can see that um, we're able to run a lot of environments in parallel um, on a single GPU, like um, the NVIDIA 2080. On the other hand, for, uh, like for, for example, for, for Habitat, which was pre do, doing pretty well on this dimension, um, we'll experience out of memory issue if there are just too many environments. And in terms of speed, um, we find that actually, if you want to do visual kind of a policy learning, the rendering speed is pretty important. So we actually had a comparison over some of the baselines. And somehow for um, the Manuscale 2, the version that we have optimized <laughs> with hard software engineering, it is a lot faster compared with um, existing ones, including Isaac Jim. So here is like, a, um, you're trying to use 512 um, environments to run in parallel, but be really because the rendering issue is, it's like the, the total, um, the, the total, the overall frame rate is, 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 is like, uh, we are basically like three times better than the Isaac J. Okay, so, so hopefully um, the optimized system will make the policy learning, the visual policy learning easier, okay, um, <laughs> with, with fewer cars. The key is that we actually have uh, tried to optimize um, the, the system to increase parallel, parallelism, um, especially um, this is a system chart like for the blue box, they are the computation that is done on CPU. For the orange part, that's the, the computation done on GPU, and then there's communication. Like um, our rendering, actually basically all the simulators have to do rendering efficiently on GPUs. Okay, now when the rendering is working, what do you do? <laughs> um, our optimization happens by, for example, computing the reward when you are also doing the rendering, because the reward computation um, is, 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 is like a, um, many of them just are, are done on the, on the CPUs. And also there are some software engineering technique like creating a separate RPC, um, <coughs> socket-based RPC um, 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 process for the rendering. And then you could have just a sync, I mean all the, the, the processes share the same, um, um, communicate with the same rendering process. That also saves the resources. Okay, so I guess this is not so interesting. It's just like uh, if you find it, you, uh, 
when you use it to be good, you, <laughs> you'll keep using that. Let me show you. Hmm? Cameras, or is that for offline data generation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's like an interaction online. Yeah, yeah. OK, let me show you some example tasks to give you a better sense. Now, this is a soft body visual imitation learning task. OK, so uh, you try to hold the bottle and pull the water into the cup. And here, um, the left is an experiment from behavior cloning. We have a lot of demos on behavior cloning. Now, this behavior cloning is having the point cloud as the input. And here, the task is, spe is specified by the implicit constraint. Basically, you need to read a picture and try to interpret or f identify this level line. You will need to fill the water until it reaches the level line. So you see that the task is specified by some implicit constraint. Um, and this morning, I had a conversation with Leslie, and she gives me very sharp suggestions. I guess um, in future, we would also consider improving like, the formulation of a task from the constraint perspective. Um, <coughs> right? So now, if you just give it a picture as the input, oh, sorry, not really the picture, the, the 3D point cloud as the input, but here you have the soft body. You probably have to use point cloud to represent it. Um, <coughs> That's not easy to learn. Now, if you additionally, you will give this, you have a separate algorithm to detect where this red line is, and then put this red line, which is the constraint or the specification of the task, to the input. Using behavior cloning, you are able to achieve generalizable policy, like pool the water. OK, now this is the second example, which is a precision assembly. Um, it, the task was originally from the transporter network paper. Now this is um, implementation and also with some improvement over the original paper. Um, so the original paper does not really simulate an insertion process. Instead, it's using the post error as a metric, like one centimeter and 15 degree. Whereas for our simulation, we actually simulate the insertion process. The an original paper uses sucker, and we use uh, uh, the pair of gripper. Well, what's important about it is like um, for different kind of objects, um, for precision assembly, in fact, it's not such e so easy to use the post error as the metric. Because like here, it's, it's a half fall, falling in, into it. And there are certain objects that if you part of it is falling into it, then just wait a bit, it will completely enter the hole. Yeah, so we feel like uh, really, um, Simulating the insertion process is useful. Okay. And we will just use the task success rate as the metric for the policy. And then the third is, um, um, as mentioned, like we have some hard articulated object manipulation tasks. In fact, for the faucet example I, I showed you before, um, it's very tricky. And when we were trying to generate the demonstrations, it's pretty hard. We tried, in the end, a mixed way. Like some of the faucet can be easily solved by planning algorithms, and some we have to solve it by reinforcement learning. Well, for those, and also reinforcement learning is also not like kind of a silver bullet, because so some of them is very hard to learn, and you probably need to use motion plan to solve it. Okay, so that's the point. Um, for now, when we're building the demos, we use the mixture way. Okay. And lastly. It's an example for the mobile dual arm manipulation. So that's the inherited from Manuscript last year. Um, this example that you will use dual arms to push a chair. And this chair is a, move, is a swivel chair with small wheels at the base. So it, it, it is actually an interactive system. Okay, so if you try to use the traditional grasping-based pipeline, it's very hard to solve it. Basically solve it, you push it, and the chair is not going to move <laughs> as you Plan. You need a closed loop, okay, and you need, to, uh, uh, <coughs> yeah, you need to consider collaboration between the arms. I'm not going to introduce a, a word to help address the problem. And there's another example which is using dual arms to move a bucket. Um, note that this is also mobile manipulation. Okay, inside the bucket there is a certain ball to change the center of mass of it, and also making it an under system. 
pretty hard for classical control methods to solve it analytically. OK, we actually have done a lot of work to make the simulation better. <laughs> so this is, the, this is the entire technique stack uh, that is uh, supporting Minuscule. Um, this part is basically a lot of NVIDIA's work. The very back end and the Vulkan um, is the rasterization uh, library. And then ShapeNet was like some kind of legacy data right, that I developed before. And then we, we start to write the <laughs> retracer. We call it the Quafu. And then there is the rasterizer. There is the, um, the PhysX, oh, here, PhysX based simulation engine for a rigid body. And then there is the Avita warp based simulator for the soft body. OK, if you're not familiar with warp, um, you probably I probably could explain that it's something like the Tai Chi, which originated from MIT. Um, it's just like, a, a, yeah, so now the support is, is kind of a more active, so we now use it. OK, um, on top of the simulation engine and the PartNet mobility data set, which is a part based on um, like animatable or simulatable, 3D rigid body asset, we have the task layer, the many skill two. Basically, many skill two is the work that we try to build a lot of tasks and get the demos. And on top of it, we also build some of the utilities like uh, the motion planning codes um, and also a reinforcement learning, imitation learning, or kind of a code base. So somehow we hope that we can gradually <laughs> build a, a, a suite that will make everyone easier to do the research in manipulation uh, skills. OK, let me introduce a little bit of the technical part. Uh, in order to make the simulation efficient, basically nowadays, uh, most of the rigid body simulators will consider to do convex decomposition. Like you have a shape, you do convex decomposition, and then you could do faster in checking the collisions. But convex decomposition is very hard problem. And so you have to consider like a process a common composition. Like for this year's SIGGRAPH 2022, we actually published a paper for addressing the common composition problem because from last year's computation, we did observe some of the shapes are not so well um, um, like uh, um, decomposed. Like here is an example. If you look at the handle of the drawer, now using the, this was the CR convex decomposition in the community, you see that the hole is filled. Whereas using our latest algorithm, um, there is the hole. Uh, just this kind of uh, correct modeling of the geometry could allow algorithm to increase the success rate. Definitely this kind of, uh, you do a simulator, you shouldn't make your, your people to solve uh, difficulties that does not exist in reality. Okay? You don't want to make it be, to be even more difficult than reality. And that method, I, I, I don't want to uh, spend much time talking about it. I just want to say that it's actually a theoretically grounded approach and also support fast uh, um, calculation. The high level idea is we want to guarantee that the approximated shape has the same property in terms of physical collision as original shape. And then this is achieved by, um, by a good concavity measure measurement. Okay, which is like a, based upon the interior host of distance and the boundary or the surface host of distance. If you're interested, you can check the paper. And we have also released code as part of the saving library. And also we try to improve the quality for the sensor simulation. It's like, you know, sensor simulation is important for the same to rail, to close same to rail gap in terms of the, 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 the visual component. And we actually find that Depth simulation is easier than um, RGB image simulation. And so here, um, we replicate the depth simulator in a system like from two views, and then um, simulate how the 3D serial pipeline is made. And therefore, the system will have the same type of error as the reality. Like here, if you're using the depth map for the 60 post estimation, um, in the algorithm train in, in a simulation could transfer very well to the real world. Okay, basically, there's just a high level introduction to how we try to make it better for the simulator to be um, realistic. 
And last year, we tried to organize a challenge to compare different kind of manipulation algorithms. And there are um, <coughs> 40 teams registered. And in the end, um, seven teams was awarded. OK, so we had three tracks. One is called no interaction track. Basically, you're only allowed to do offline learning. And second is called no annotation track. It's like, OK, you can use reinforcement learning, but you can't provide external expertise. Like you, you have pre-training. No, that's not allowed. And the third is like no restriction track. And um, we had a workshop that I, I cleared to summarize the result. I guess the result is not really surprising. That interaction is important. Now, if you're only using behavior cloning for a lot of the tricky tasks, especially under action system, it's very hard to solve. And then if you allow interaction, suddenly you get, you get better. And the best approach now is still like uh, not from uh, um, like end-to-end -end learning. The best approach is in a no restriction track. Um, it's from a company, JD. They actually used uh, the more traditional TMP approach to solve the problem. However, for learning-based approach, it's also not that far. OK, so, so I don't know. Like, I think I mean, this actually looks interesting to me. It's like uh, uh, using end-to-end -end learning, there's actually some hope um, to solve a lot of the difficult problems. For the sake of time, I don't uh, dig deeper. And then um, saving the many skill is also benefiting research from other groups. Like this is a res this work from CMU, from David House group. They, they actually um, won the, the RSS tw 2022 Best Paper Award nominee. OK, just one. <laughs> this is a little bit of sales flavor. Right? <laughs> and next, I'm not going to talk about um, you know, like, uh, how good many skill is. I'm going to introduce some of the algorithm work. Okay. And this algorithm work originated from us building and solving many skills. We're going to talk about a topic called scalable policy learning. OK. So you want to learn a policy to solve a lot of tasks. Actually, it's very hard to try it. Like you want to use reinforcement learning to learn a policy network um, to solve all the tasks together. This is very difficult. OK. Why is it so difficult? Um, in order to analyze it, we have a minimalist example. Like here is a fork-shaped maze. Now, the stars means the goals. Each star corresponds to, like for example, one of the manipulation scale, one manipulation task. OK. Now, you are solving this navigation kind of problem. The agent always starts from here. So every time, <coughs> for every episode, um, you're given the position of the agent and a goal position. And then you want to use deep reinforcement learning to solve it, let's say. That's, like, that's, that's the goal. What, what we observe is that joint training agent by reinforcement learning, we call such kind of agent as general agent, is very hard because at the beginning, you just, all the agents, no matter which goal is, needs to uh, uh, you know, uh, reach, it will just move towards this point. It will get rewards as long as it's moving the, uh, making the movement towards this direction. And therefore, after a while of training, the network starts to ignore the goal information in the input of the network. It's like if it's fully visual, um, you have the network to process the state and the goal altogether. After a while, the network starts to forget about, to ignore those kind of goal dimensions. We call it catastrophic ignorance. After they reach here, they need to pay attention to the goal. However, it's just the network lost attention to those dimensions. And then it's very hard to be relearned. Now, on the other hand, if you, have, you train specialists, like you train five separate policy networks, each just to target on one of the goal. Obviously, it's easy. There's no, not, not such kind of like catastrophic ignorance problem. But that will remind us to combine, I mean, the, the, the idea of like generalist training and specialist training. Okay, like generalist, all the five, all the agents will learn to go through the passage together. And they, they could share something. So for general training, it's faster at the first, but then tends to have worse asymptotic performance. Whereas for specialist training, it's slower at the beginning, 
but it tends to have better asymptotic performance in the end. OK, and specialist training can be trivially parallelized. That will just inspire to have a very simple meta algorithm for doing RL at scale. This is like you first train generalist until you find that the performance start to hit a certain kind of plateau. And then you will split your um, task space and train a lot of the specialists. And once those specialists have been trained, you use the specialists to collect a lot of demos. And then you will do learning from uh, demonstration by, by continuing to train a generalist. You could choose algorithm to do this learning from demonstration. Like, for example, the, 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 there are the basic algorithms like DAPG or like Guile, um, um, basically those kind of uh, learning from demonstration algorithms. They could distill experience from the specialist to become a stronger generalist. This was actually a way that we find the best to solve the many scale one challenge to get a generalist um, <coughs> agent. Now, here's a curve. Like here is the initial beginning, a uh, training stage for a generalist to reach a plateau. And if you just keep on training, you see that that's the part. It's very slow to train a generalist. Instead, now we split and start to train the specialist. And when <laughs> the specialist also gets very slow to train, we start to do the learning from imitation of a generalist from roll out demos by the specialist. And then you will get much better performance from the generalist, even better than the, all the specialists. I guess this is similar to how it's a human society, right? Like, like there are like, like, uh, people in different kind of area and then develop, and then they try to te write textbooks. And for the younger generation, you, get, you become better than us. <laughs> OK. <laughs> yeah. Um, for the sake of time, I guess I'll uh, skip here. The takeaway is that, um, well, there is the meta algorithm for large scale RL. It's like, although RL is hard, we can try to use divide conquer to solve it. And also, if the task can be solved individually, they can also be solved jointly. And finally, it makes it easy to parallel to train the specialists. OK, so uh, next. Um, mm -hmm. Sure. The talk was that you have these many skills yes. for manipulation, right? So do you think that we should be training one skill for all of manipulation, all of the short-term manipulation, or do you think we still need many skills? OK. Um, I think that in the end, you need a robot that is able to have a lot of skills. So it would be some kind of a meta, meta learner. Um, and from the discovery of those experiments, probably a reasonable way is to separate the stage of collecting demos and the learning generalist. You use whatever way you could to, to collect the demos. Like for example here, you do divide and conquer to collect the demos for each of the scale, each of the task. And then somehow you try to use online learning from demonstration to, to merge them, to become a, a generalist. Yeah, that's All kind of. Is there a reason to stop uh, merging? At some point, it's still useful to have specialists. Mm. <laughs> um, yeah, well, that's a harder question to, to answer. In fact, something that we observe is, although this is, um, I think our experiment is still not uh, solid enough to give the full answer, but the one interesting observation is with the generalist training step, it actually is able to outperform all the specialists. So somehow the knowledge distillation process does have certain help in overcoming certain kind of a local minimums encountered by specialists. For this part, I feel is particularly interesting. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, OK. And then I'm going to talk about a topic which is called 3D visual policy learning. Um, which is based upon very recent work. Uh, my background was quite um, in 3D perception. And I think that um, that's because I did try to push 3D perception towards the goal of robotics. Okay? So intuitively, interaction takes place in 3D place. And 3D input representation should allow easier relationship reasoning. 
Now, if you feel, if you see the big trend of the community moving, um, it's also somehow moving from 2D based to, or even 2.5D based to 3D based. Like for example, for the problem of grasp of post prediction, if you go back a few years before, to ago uh, to the like uh, 2016, then the, the method was using depth map based approach. And nowadays, if you check the paper of like grass proposed prediction, most of them, I see the art, are based upon 3D. It's just like 3D is native for reasoning, like relationships. So I would ask the question now, if you will use, like, for example, reinforcement learning to do um, more complex skills, like I would think more complex skills, are like an extension of grasping, uh, would 3D do better? That's a question I have. Okay, and, and we, <laughs> Metascope provides native support for like point cloud based um, policy learning. Like here, this is uh, how the robot captures the panoramic point cloud. <coughs> okay, um, I want to discuss like a, a fundamental question in, in using 3D point cloud input for reinforcement learning. Okay, which is actually a, a pretty intuitive a point as well. Now, if you want to say you're using point clouds as the input to the policy or value network, unlike 2D images, there's a very natural choice of frame. For 3D point cloud, you must first choose a coordinate frame to represent the XYZs. For example, you could choose the world frame, a static world frame to represent the point cloud XYZ. You could consider to choose any factor frame. You could like do object detection or part detection first and choose the part or object frame. And then if you have a robot which is mobile, you could consider to use the robot base frame. The question is, does the choice of a frame affect the sample efficiency or generalizability of the learned policy? Okay. Um, the view is, the view we, we, we reached is, the proper frame choice will align the input and may simplify network training. An example is like for picking up an object or opening like the door of a cabinet. Now, if you are using the end effector frame, you, up, you, bind, you bind the frame at the end effector, the end effector will always be aligned in this frame. Okay, throughout the whole trajectory. And the benefit is that, like for this task, you definitely need to reason the relative pose between your end effector and the part of the object. Now in this frame, the binary relationship reasoning becomes only estimating the pose of the part to be manipulated. You see the point? Because there are originally two things, end effector and the part to be manipulated. It's a relation reasoning problem. Now it becomes like a single singleton. Yeah. So this reduction makes it much easier for networks to learn. We tried a lot of tricks for like a 3D point cloud learning, uh, RL, but this seems to be the most effective one. Okay. Now let me show you more evidence by curves. For the task in many scale, we try to use the world frame, or robot frame, or end effect frame, or target object apart frame to train an RL. In general, you can see that green curve is usually pretty high, and the green curve is actually the end effect frame. And in general, the, the black curve is relatively low, and the black curve is actually a static world frame for rapid point cloud. Okay. So like networks are not so smart to automatically transform it in a correct way. Um, and this example, if you just use a single frame, and in fact the frame is usually good. However, the question, like we have the dual arm pro, uh, task, right? And then left arm has an end effector frame, and the right arm has an end effector frame, right? Which end effector frame to use? Because that's an additional question. Is it possible to actually combine the effect of multiple frames and do better? 
And in fact, this is also true. We tried a few architectures to fuse information or predictions from different frame choices. Okay, like uh, in the end, we learn a, a way that along the manipulation process, we will adaptively assign temporally varying weights. Like at certain frames, some frame, a, a certain well, time point, some frame has higher weights. Others have lower weights. I don't talk about the detail of the architecture. Like we try transformer, we try to make sure expert. Um, basically, they are the most intuitive way you can come about. And then turns out that they do not differ so much. <laughs> okay, the key is to consider combining different frames. You tone them carefully. <clears throat> okay, so um, yeah, so the main discovery is like, if you consider like using the, the correct way of reweighting the, the prediction from different frames, it will outperform even the best single frame result, like any factor frame result. And the more important, and more interesting is like for mobile manipulation tasks, for the first stage for the robot to approach the object, the base frame seems to have a higher weight. And while the manipulation starts, the end factor frame starts with again a higher weights. Yeah, so <laughs> this example um, is not like a deep theory or like a hard algorithm. It's just like a, I want to use the example to, to tell you that you know, for 3D point cloud reinforced learning, there are different dimensions I think of the problem. Okay. Uh, lastly, I guess I will use very fast speed to talk about some of the fundamental aspect for, for like uh, the, the, the skill of policy learning, um, which are also around reinforced learning. Now, for the biggest challenge we face, we think is like um, from manipulation scales, you know, they are like controlling robot arms, and they actually have high dimensional action space, and which are continuous. Now, you have a policy to output high dimensional actions, continuous actions. Now, by the policy optimization theory, either like reinforcement learning or like trajectory optimization, um, you actually need the policy distribution to be a multimodality or actually arbitrary distribution in general. And for exploration purposes, you also need the policy distribution to be multimodality. Okay, but you know, formulating a multimodality distribution itself is very tricky. So that was like a fundamental question we're interested in. And one of the work was the, called the temporal difference learning for model predictive control. And that was inspired by the success of AlphaGo. So the reason for AlphaGo to succeed, I would summarize like there are at least two, three key points. The first is use Monte Carlo tree search to search locally with exploration ability. And they use the value network to keep the, the, the globally best value and generalize the value prediction across states. And the third is, is relying on a perfect world model, which is a transition model. So, we want to extend the success of our goal to the continuous um, 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 uh, control space. And then the very high level plan is just like, the Mount Carlo tree search is like um, local search. And then in a continuous space, we replace that by model predictive control, which is also a local search, get the local optimality. And then for the value network, it's good, keep it. For the perfect world model in our goal, replace it by some learned model. And this work, we learn the model in a latent space. Uh, for the sake of time, I'll just skip it. And we'll tell you that it's basically like using TD to, to incorporate the value and MPC to replace the role of MCTS in AlphaGo. So combine them together. The good part is it's able to solve some very challenging control problems. Like for this DeepMind do dog, our method is the first documented approach <laughs> that's able to, to learn the, 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 the guide. Okay, um, so, um, so I guess this is a state art um, um, a model based approach for continuous uh, control. And then um, lastly, this is the a work relevant to a recent uh, a result from, <laughs> from Russ. Okay, so we, again, this is about a question like uh, if you have the high dimensional continuous action space, um, and then you need to maintain the multimodality of the policy network. How do you deal with it? Okay, like 
if you think classical approach like RRT, it does maintain a multimodality way because it's maintaining a tree. Whereas for a lot of our approaches, they are using a single modality Gaussian as the parameterization of the policy network. And then somehow, you are very much prone to st getting stuck in local minimum. And the high level idea of us is like, OK, now we just don't want to mod model multimodality distribution, right? And we kind of know that diffusion models, they are able to do that. The generative models are able to do that. And now, <laughs> so could we consider to like, use similar ideas in the continuous policy learning, right? And for example, um, we consider a latent code from the Gaussian space and use a decoder to decode it into a distrib decode it into a trajectory. And somehow the decoder can be learned for the sequence to sequence of uh, decoding purpose that allows multimodality distribution. Okay. And then I'll, I basically escape all the math and come to the most important result. It's like diffusion model was derived with the uh, variational inference method. And therefore, we can use the same framework basically to derive a kind of uh, policy, new policy gradient result. And the new policy gradient result comes up with a very elegant form, <laughs> which if you recognize, this is a part basically very similar to the policy gradient theorem. And this is the part um, basically like directly optimizing the cumulative reward of a trajectory, the trajectory optimization part. It's like an um, interesting linear combination of them. Um, but I skip all the, all, the, all, the, all the durations, just to get a very high level idea. So um, yeah, so, so we hope that such kind of work could make further progress and then allow us to be, I mean, to use them in manipulation policy learning, okay. Um, it's just a result that we, in this like, maze experiment, starting from here to navigate to here, that's a multi-step uh, navigation problem. Okay, there are a lot of trajectories that actually are optimal. And then after convergence, the algorithm is able to learn a distribution of the optimal trajectories. Okay, so let me conclude. Uh, first, uh, I want to show the importance of manipulation scales. And then I introduced some efforts in like building a benchmark for manipulation skills and how to achieve like scalable policy learning by generalist specialist framework. And then how we build stable 3 d reinforcement learning framework. And lastly, like, well, a very difficult problem is like high dimensional continuous action space. And um, now how do we parameterize the model for achieving a goal? Okay, so that's it for my talk. Okay, thank you very much. Um, anybody have any questions? I'll, I'll run around with the microphone. Do we, yeah, I guess we still need it for the recording. Uh, thanks for your great talk, Professor Hao. So I have a question for the frame manner work. Uh -huh. So uh, in, this, in that case, you uh, learn uh, like few different uh, kind of frame transformation. So I'm wondering like, if you do it directly, can you just learn kind of uh, embedding or transformation that directly taking the uh, word frame point cloud to uh, another. Oh, yeah, I understand. It's like you, you say, can we learn a spatial transformer, right? Something like that. Right? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, on um, the experiment, is, it's very, very difficult. I guess it's because the, um, in the reinforcement learning and supervision, it's, it's, it's very, very noisy. So it's like not lack yeah. of supervision, something like Yes, that. and also we find that for transformers, those kind of architectures, if they directly plug them in for policy learning, um, that's very fragile. Yeah, so it's a tricky question. Okay. But probably some pre-training pre will change the story. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I'll ask one, and then I'll hand it to Eric. Okay. Um, okay. So. You had an image net moment, you know, and we've had, we had there's some sense in which um, scale and diversity of data sets made great things happen in computer vision. Right. And now you're taking a simulation-based approach to try to build up a similar opportunity for manipulation. 
I believe the scale comes easily in simulation. How much diversity do you need in the simulation? Will you be able to author enough tasks um, by hand or, or whatever? How do we get the diversity to have like our, our breakthrough moment uh, for big data for, for manipulation? And do you think we're on the path? Do you think something brand, brand new has to happen? Um, that's a great question. Um, I think it's, 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 it's not easy to answer. First of all, my view is like for the manipulation, there could be like the higher level part and lower level part. The lower level part is relatively like scale, a short horizon. And then the higher level part is like a very high level, um, I mean, long horizon. And then for the long horizon part, I think I mean, you have a sufficient, uh, probably sufficient data source, which actually is not that easy from the internet videos. Whereas for the low level manipulation scales, um, so far, I feel like uh, the simulation is still like the most uh, scalable approach, uh, just my opinion. Um, um, and we think that the point to extend the scope of like tasks depends on how many like new objects, 3D objects can be captured or modeled. And that's a motivation for our group to actually also push the field for 3D modeling. Yeah, like, you know, there are some recent progress in NERF, all those approaches. I think they give new opportunities for, for 3D capturing of a lot of different objects. And now if that happens fast, the probably like in the simulation world, the number of models to simulate could also grow fast. Yeah. Um, at the uh, beginning of your presentation, you mentioned force feedback as a potential, I guess, observation space or an action space. Mm -hmm. Do y'all have plans for that? Like in the in the man, in the many skill setup? Um, can you repeat them? You didn't follow that. Oh, you mentioned force feedback. A oh, force feedback. Oh, at oh the okay, okay, okay. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> so adding force feedback at the joints is kind of easy. But adding force feedback at each of the triangles to be good is more trickier. Basically, you need some kind of finite element method for the simulation. Now, um, um, looking to the, the progress in the computer graphics community, the good news is like uh, um, there are some good progress of finite element method. <laughs> like uh, they are getting faster and probably will have a hope to be deployed for the robot learning environments. So I would feel hope, I mean like uh, we can get really good uh, tactile dense tactile uh, simula sensor simulators with that kind of technology. Yeah. Awesome. Thank yeah, you. you can check. There's a technology called um, um, IPC, um, Increment Potential Contact Method. Yeah. OK. I, I, we have food and drinks over to the side. Um, I want to thank Howe once again for coming. And uh, hope everybody stays around and be social.